Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to our witnesses, and welcome to those who have joined us in the gallery as visitors. Um, just to begin the, process, the normal way of asking everyone to make sure their mobile phones, etc., are switched off, or at least don't interfere with the systems. Um, we have one apology this morning, that's from Alison Johnston. And with that, I'll proceed straight to agenda item one, which is an evidence-taking session from business organisations around the Smith Commission proposals. Um, and I'd like to introduce you left to right, and hopefully I get this all right, Stuart Patrick, who's the Chief Executive from Glasgow Chamber of Com Commerce. We've got Alan Watt, who's the Chief Executive of Civil Engineering Contractors Association. Uh, we have Ross Martin, who's the Chief Executive of the Scottish Council for Development and Industry. And we have David Watt, who is the Regional Director for the Institute of Directors. And welcome to you all this morning. We're very glad that they're here. Um, the focus may not be on this committee this morning, given that the other things that are going on around draft clauses being published today. But we're, we welcome you here. We think you're the most important visitors to Parliament. Um, Summarise quickly the structure. We'll try to keep this as informal as we can. And obviously, we still have to do it through the chair. Um, there are four witnesses. So if we can you know, make our questions as concise as we can and answers, obviously, in the same, that, same way that would help. I, I think we'll start off by asking questions around taxation and borrowing, um, move into welfare issues, are there any questions there, and deal with the other issues to sweep up um, any other important matters as we go through the process. That will give us a bit of structure around what we, what we do this morning. And, you know, and I'll address the questions, and most, I think most members will do so. May, to, to all the panellists, if you feel you want to contribute, please indicate. Um, and maybe individual members of the committee want to ask specific questions of specific individuals. We'll see how it goes. But I thought I would ask a very general question to begin with myself. I'd like to understand uh, to what extent the Smith Commission proposals constitute in your eyes a set of, of powers that should enable the Scottish Government to create conditions that would improve the, Scottish, the performance of the Scottish economy and create jobs, and whether, uh, in that sense, you think Smith Commission's helped or are other things that could have been done. Um, and I, I don't mind who kicks off. Ross looks he's like he's ready to go. Um, <coughs> thanks, <coughs> thanks very much, convener, um, morning committee. Um, it's... Just to get a, a, a bit of context, as far as we're concerned, I think, and I think probably this will apply to everybody um, at this end of the table. Um, if you look at the impact of any changes to the, the particularly the tax system, um, and actually sitting in this building is as good a reminder as any of the, the attractiveness to some of asymmetry, um, but obviously asymmetry and, the, and its attractiveness is in the eye of the beholder, and and the common um, concern, I think, would be that with additional levels and, com and layers of complexity come additional levels and layers of cost. Um, but um, there is a recognition, certainly from SCDI's point of view, and a long-standing recognition that the centralisation of the UK economy has been an issue for decades, and a rebalancing of that um, is a necessary part of uh, the negotiation, uh, and we certainly welcome a rebalancing of that. And we've been calling for a rebalancing of the system for, um, you know, ever since I was ever since I was born, really. So in 1969, uh, when I was still in short trousers, um, SCDI were looking at the impact of the centralisation of the economy and and the impact of the uh, centripetal pull to to London. Um, and in particular, looking at the impact on the big cities uh, and uh, the effect that that unbalancing of the economy was beginning to have, both in the private sector and in the public sector, and looking to see uh, what can be put in place in order to rebalance the economy and give the nations and regions, as we would now call them, the opportunity to do exactly as you were suggesting, convener, and that's to have a package of measures... Uh, a context, a set of powers, um, the ability to effect positive change um, in any part of the, the UK economy um, 
and do that in a way which was which obviously uh, uh, provides benefit uh, to to that that part of the economy. From SCDI's perspective, uh, then uh, we would talk about uh, having an economic benefit test to any proposals, any individual proposals, but making sure that uh, things aren't seen in isolation and the the package as a whole um, is seen collectively and together, and that there's some form of test. And the Chancellor yesterday, in his evidence to the Treasury Select Committee, uh, went a stage further, I think, and, and it would be interesting to see exactly what he means by no detriment uh, and whether that places boundaries on the package on, and, and whether it moves from boundaries to control um, and, and control mechanisms. So it will be interesting to see what's said today and, and what follows on from that. But fundamentally... The UK economy is one of the most centralised in the world. There is a broad recognition that that needs to change and we welcome the discussion and the ability to have that discussion in a sensible and open way. OK. Stuart. Um, Stuart Badger from Glasgow Chamber of Commerce. Um, really, three points, I think, just to throw in. Uh, broad welcome from the membership that uh, powers are being transferred in much the same way as Ross has described from SCDI. Uh, reinforcing the, 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 the recognition that the balance of uh, fundraising within both national parliaments within the UK and, for that matter, within cities within the UK has been too limited. Um, we're constantly struck by the percentage of revenue raised either within Scotland or within the city regions uh, being under 20% compared to an OECD average of over 50%. We do think that has implications for the uh, productivity performance of the country. Um, we therefore welcome the, um, the nod that there was in the Smith Commission towards further devolution of powers beyond the National Parliament because we think that it's important to recognise that UK cities on average tend to be underperforming in productivity terms compared to their competitors overseas and we want to understand more about why that's happening. We think the transfer of revenue raising powers to local cities, local re uh, communities is part of that story. The second issue is around single market. We welcome the fact that the Smith Commission did not appear to have significant implications for the UK single market. Now, that's not to say that uh, uh, in introduction or implementation of individual powers might lead us into that territory, and we're quite concerned that there should be some mechanism not dissimilar to what Ross is saying about a test, uh, some mechanism for judging what the implications of any use of the powers might be on that single market. We drifted into that territory occasionally, even under the existing regime. I know it's controversial, but minimum pricing for alcohol is a good example where the discussion about uh, the use of that power is affecting free trade potential beyond the single market in the UK. We don't want that sort of situation to arise within the UK. So that's the second point. And the third point is to note that whilst we welcome the transfer of all the, the, the powers around income tax, we've got to have an, uh, an awareness of the, of the responses from our members during the campaign that said of the issues they felt were most important, income tax was, one, was near to the top of the list. So how the income tax powers were used, I can't guarantee how the members would react to particular uses of income tax powers. I think that's the final point that I would lay in front of you. Mm, no one likes increased taxes. We know that as <laughs> a, as a starting point. David, yeah. just make a few uh, general points here, and, and members, if I can. Really, I think first of all, business has always been very enthusiastic about this Parliament having some accountability for its income as well as its expenditure. It's very easy. People in business uh, see it's quite easy to spend money. It's much more uh, difficult when you have to be accountable for how it's raised and the implications of that. And I'm not totally sure that these implications are always necessarily thought through. Um, so that's a big issue for us as well. And I think going forward. Um, We'll wait and see how that actually pans out, but I think it's very good as a principle that this Parliament should be accountable for its income as well as its spending, and a significant amount of that anyway as well. Um, I think a key point that actually that Robert Smith said uh, in the report, which actually is not legislative, but the fact of working together is crucial as well, I've got to say. Um, we do all, I think, encounter at times departments bluntly not speaking to each other. I'm not sure it doesn't sometimes happen within the Scottish Government, but let's part that for a little while as well. It certainly does happen between the Scottish Government and the UK Government, and it's extremely detrimental 
obviously, particularly in the areas, for example, of return to work, it's one area, and I think that's one other area I would mention that's really, I think, because I was involved with it, the um, now First Minister's uh, Commission looking at uh, welfare reform, um, and I think uh, there's a real need for working together in certain areas there, which would be really, really helpful. And I'd think, bluntly, I think Biz is completely disconnected with Scotland, if I'm honest. Whose fault that is, I'm not totally sure. Probably faults on both sides, but it's not helpful to business in Scotland, to be quite frank, and I think we need to get that sorted for the future um, benefit of everybody, to be quite honest with you. So some of these principles, I think, are, uh, I think that's welcome as well. So there's some principles in that are welcome, um, but as Stuart said, I think if I, we'll wait and see how some of it actually pans out in relation to certain taxation issues as well. Okay, thank you, David. Alan, do you want to... One of the nice things about going last is that most of the things you were going to say have been said. But uh, that said, um, I'm slightly different from the other uh, gentlemen here today in that I'm representing a single sector, and that single sector is very dependent on public sector expenditure. So we're watching this very closely. Our members largely welcomed the, the, uh, the recommendations and are very keen because we believe that... Um, Throughout its history, the Scottish Parliament has spent wisely what it's had and therefore extending its borrowing powers would seem very logical. And obviously to raise these, you have to have a methodology for raising them. So again, uh, broadly welcome that. The, the caveat that we would put there is that our industry, although it is quite high in turnover, it's um, roughly 2.5 billion uh, turnover, is very low in margin. The margin is, we estimate, between 2 and 5 per cent, therefore quite sensitive to changes, and therefore we would ask that any changes in taxation or legislation are, are drilled down to very deeply to just check what the implications and the wider implications and indeed some of the unintended implications of them might be. Just go down a bit on that issue of borrowing powers, because it was something that I think all submissions touched on. Um, and obviously we've got a bit to go in terms of the arrangements that's got to come through the, the UK and the Scottish Government. There's a bit to travel there to understand exactly what they'll look like, but obviously the principle is there for extending it. I think it would be helpful for us if, if anyone could provide us with a picture of what you think, would, yeah, what the sensible arrangements around borrowing should be. Do you, is there a, an, a, 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 a general amount of borrowing that... You think Scotland should be able to borrow too? Should it be based on the prudential borrowing system effective local authorities have? What arrangements do you think would be the best suitable for Scotland? So we, we've got an opportunity, obviously, as this is, still hasn't been um, settled down yet and there's a lot of discussion to... Well, you've got the opportunity to influence it today. So. The piece, um, not just on borrowing, but on the, on the whole array, then obviously Scotland, um, not having had um, responsibility for revenue raising, um, and, and that side of the, the balance sheet, is, as, as the DFM would put it, then we've not got the mechanisms by which to independently assess. Um, so, the, so the OBR's role, for example, um, comes into question, and whether... Uh, they would be the appropriate body and mechanism by which to, to do that. And, and whether that's the OBR as exists or whether it's devolved in some way, as, as some members would suggest, um, then there certainly needs to be that, that maturation uh, in terms of the accountability and responsibility um, aspect. And that was a, a big aspect of our, our members' views with rights come responsibilities and with responsibilities come the need for uh, regulation, um, but clever, agile, flexible, accessible, transparent regulation. Um, so there, there does have to be, you know, a proper discussion about how you do that. You know, who's going to be responsible for it? What are the metrics going to be? Who's going to be responsible for the policing of it? Who's going to be responsible for uh, fiscal transfers if required, for example? Uh, so there's a whole range of different. Um, issues in there which this body uh, hasn't necessarily had to tackle in the past um, but is going to have to get up to speed with, with pretty quickly. Obviously a crucial issue for your own industry, Alan, because of the heavily dependent of public, public expenditure uh, into infrastructure through borrowing. Any particular things you'd like to add to? No, I think well there, actually. Okay. Um, uh, I suppose, mate, I think back up the point of some sort of Scottish OBR might be quite welcome going forward as well. Um, I suppose very much we would point out that we don't want boring for the sake of boring. We want boring for a purpose. 
uh, like all other powers, and, and, and very much for a purpose, for example, related to infrastructure development, uh, and, and certainly not um, a situation that the UK has got itself into of just boring to keep its you know normal revenue spend actually working. There's not a way we want to go for a future of Scotland. I don't think that's beneficial. But if we can borrow sensibly for things like, I mean, Forth Crossing, which is close to my heart, having spent some time in that bridge this morning, uh, and then let's do that, absolutely. And, and there's many areas of the A9 and things that the government's embarked on and others round the room could suggest be really worthwhile borrowing for over a long period of time at a sensible government rate. That makes a lot of sense. But to get into it for revenue spend is, is a recipe for death and disaster, as many other countries have seen. Okay, well, thank you. Right. I sure. think we would, um, we'd welcome the a discussion within borrowing about that distinction between capital and revenue borrowing. Um, conscious that I suspect from what members say that they, they feel comfortable with the idea that whatever Scotland gains in borrowing powers is taken off the UK so that the overall UK envelope remains uh, um, sound. But I think where there, there tends to be some room for manoeuvre is do you have a little bit more flexibility in coming up with capital borrowing powers for infrastructure investment? So I, I, I wonder about whether that UK envelope around capital borrowing, whether there's scope for a little bit of marginal uh, increase in the, the Scottish room for manoeuvre than, than being constrained within the UK overall package. So that's the one area I think worth examining. Uh, Ross, and then I'll come to Tavish and then Mark. I'll just add one, um, one other point to that. So as well as borrowing, then looking at other ways of leveraging in ex external finance, particularly for infrastructure projects. So one of the issues which we um, raised in, in our submission was the, the possibility of bringing the offshore and the onshore economies together and putting in place, for example, tax credits, allowances for offshore. I know in, in current circumstances that's, that's probably more of a challenge, but um, in, you know, in, in normal times then being able to allow and enable uh, oil and gas companies, for example, to invest in onshore infrastructure. Um, so, for example, as part of the city deal in, in the North East, if there's going to be one. Uh, and, and in full recognition, that the development of that infrastructure is going to help that sector in terms of labour mobility. Okay. Um, there's a couple of supplementaries being indicated. Tavish, I think you wanted to... Yeah, thanks, thanks so much, Convener. Uh, firstly, can I thank you for your points on a tar no br which I've been arguing for for a long time, and more, the more you all say on that, the better in terms of the independence of forecasting and the independence of analysis. Um, Mr Patrick, you made a very good point about a te on the single market, because again, all your submissions have, have uh, highlighted the importance of a UK single market. You mentioned a test on the impact on the single market. Could you just elaborate on that? I mean, I agree with the principle, but if you could elaborate on that, on that principle, I'd be most grateful. Well, I guess we're, we're I, I suppose, an interest interesting comparator for examining this would be the discussions around um, TTIP just now, uh, the extent to which we are attempting to try and remove barriers to trade between US and Europe, and, it, and uh, acknowledging there are contra controversial components to that too, we, uh, we would say that business regulation is the largest part of the challenge in delivering TTIP. It's not necessarily direct tariffs, no one suggesting within the UK that we start having financial tariffs, but we could over time find that consumer protection, environmental protection, health and safety in particular, lead to regulatory decisions that affect products and their ability to enter markets. So it may end up that you have Scottish regulations that you by accident discover end up putting cost on products uh, either accessing from uh, other parts of the UK or more damagingly obviously to us uh, in accessing other parts of the UK because that's such a fundamental part of the of the trading arrangements of the single market. So quite often I think the regulation issues are, are, are more difficult to spot right up front. That's why we, th we would suggest that there is a test or even some form of business advisory group to the Parliament that highlights to you well in advance where um, the implementation of a power or a particular act under a power might lead to a regulatory barrier between the, the different parts of the, of the UK. Some mechanism that, in fairness, doesn't currently exist that gives business an opportunity to comment on these matters as they're first thought of in regulation or in draft statute. Exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, Tavish. Yes, thank you. Mark. Uh, sorry, sorry, Ross. I should make clear on the, the Tartan OBR um, idea uh, that we haven't gone as far as to call for, for that. Yes that um, particular change but we have we have made the point that the need for that level data um, is absolute um, and so whatever mechanism is put in place <coughs> we do need to be able to get disaggregated data 
Uh, I think Mark had a supplementary in that area as well, and then I'll come to I think it's to Lewis. Yeah, um, we've taken evidence from um, Professor David Held uh, or David Heald uh, of Aberdeen University uh, regarding some of the complexities that may arise as a result of devolution of tax powers, for example, um, and we've seen some indication of that playing out in terms of the way that the land and buildings transaction tax process has gone. The concern being that the Scottish Government consults early and certainly in terms of the Scottish rate of income tax that's coming in uh, has to notify the Treasury uh, well in advance of the Treasury setting tax rates uh, at a UK level. And the concern is that there could be gaming by the Treasury, uh, particularly when it comes to assignation of VAT the example used by Professor Heald is um, that when Scotland sets its income tax level, the UK could uh, essentially reduce income tax but hike VAT, which would have an impact in the rest of the UK, but obviously because Scotland would be setting its own income tax rate and receiving an assignation of VAT, it would not have the flexibility in that in that regard. Is that a concern that you would have? And one of the points that's been raised at the Finance Committee, which I serve on by the Law Society of Scotland, is that perhaps some form of financial fair play agreement or clause uh, is required to ensure that these kind of scenarios don't arise. I'd be interested in your views on that. Uh, all I can say is that's a... I can publicly criticise the Treasury. Um, uh, <laughs> no, <that's, laughs> no, no. Uh, uh, the point I made earlier on, really, genuinely, uh, first and foremost, the departments should be should be working together across the UK. As long as we are a United Kingdom, we should be working together as United Kingdom. And I don't think a department, including the Treasury, is allowed to be willy nilly either, you know, not consult Scotland or rough, ride roughshod over this Parliament and things. I mean, it just shouldn't be allowed to happen to us. And if you have to lay that down in statute, then perhaps you have to do that. Absolutely, it's complex, and it will be complex over the first few years in particular. And, and we, I suppose, at Sharp End, will suffer from some of these complexities you know, of, of Scottish rates of income taxes coming anyway and things like that. So, all these challenges for business. And I suppose what we want is we don't want. Um, I was going to call it stupidity, that's maybe a bit impolite, but anybody being really difficult to make our life in, in the HR department or the, the accounts department of a business life even more difficult by being silly about VAT or taxation and not being open and helpful and consulting and setting levels as far in advance as possible to allow business to put the mechanism in place in order to collect the tax, which it does on behalf of this Parliament and others as well. And that's a real disenchantment the business has. We are tax collectors, first and foremost, for you guys, and you, we need to be cooperatively supported in that. And uh, departments fighting each other just makes that even worse than it already is, and it's not very pleasant as it is. Ross. Although we're in uncharted waters as far as the, the reshaping of the UK is concerned, it's not uncharted in international terms. I mean, we have visitors, I don't know if they're here yet, from, from Canada. Um, and, and clearly there are systems around the world where they, they strike that balance and they operate on, uh, on a set of principles with agreed metrics. Um, and there's a, a recognition that that has to be set clear at the outset so that the, the, the latitude for mischief making or for gaming as you would call it Mark then is, is reduced considerably uh, you know so there are mature systems around the world from which we can learn in terms of the, the, the uh, relative power um, and the, the relationship between the federal level and the, and the state level I suppose inevitably you're going to have differences uh, emerging over time. Um, but I, I can understand why uh, one aspect of it might be considered to be gaming, the other might be responding to the demands of local areas. If I'm in Newcastle and I'm watching Scotland make decisions on local taxation that will have very direct and quite immediate impacts on investment patterns, I wouldn't be too surprised if chancellors in, in uh, future uh, treasuries are not under significant pressure to respond. Um, so I, I, can, I can imagine actually that might lead to uh, a degree again of enforcement of um, greater devolution to local areas because you'd want to have the flexibility if you're the Treasury to be able to respond to some of those requirements in a Newcastle or a North West uh, in order to be able to remain competitive. So I think we should expect that. Okay. Um, at this moment, just let me welcome formally the, our guests from the Canadian <coughs> Parliament who did join us during the, the beginning of the session. So welcome to our, our deliberations and listening in to what we're up to.
Uh, Lewis. Thank you very much. Uh, convener asked at the outset about your general take on the powers devolved under the Smith Agreement to the Scottish Parliament. Can I ask uh, a couple of uh, questions uh, around, if you like, those general considerations, but from a slightly different angle? First of all, in relation to city regions, and Stuart Patrick, the Glasgow submission is very strong in city regions. The SCDI uh, and Ross Martins mentioned it already this morning, the proposition of city deals that would apply to Aberdeen is, is, is certainly applying for one, and, and Glasgow already has one other. So is the view of the panel that the Smith Agreement uh, goes far enough or says enough about devolution from the Scottish Parliament to localities or city regions, uh, or at least does it lay the basis that allows that to happen going forward? Uh, I'd say I, I, the argument is that uh, we were delighted to see that Lord Smith did uh, nod towards it, but felt that it was uh, understandable that he didn't go further because it was arguably not within his remit. Um, but we would certainly welcome the fact that he's opened the door to that discussion. I, 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 I just think that if you're sitting in Glasgow or indeed in Aberdeen, and I would say straight up that we are absolutely enthusiastic about the notion of city deals for all of the cities of, of uh, Scotland. It's not a question of uh, one city benefiting over another. It's actually a whole change in the system uh, of governance across the UK to reflect the fact that uh, our approach to metropolitan urban development has been behind so many of our competitors. And the reason why that's so important is that cities and urban, particularly city regions, have become much more important for attracting investment and developing business, largely because they're centres of innovation. They've and that's become so much more important to achieving productive growth in the in the the whole UK economy. In the UK and in the Scottish economy, our most fundamental problem is productivity. Um, if our cities are, are below, well below average on productivity, London aside, which is a very unusual case, we've got a question to ask about why that's, why that's happening. And our view is that the balance of powers has been too skewed towards London, yes. Equally, there's a risk that we take the step towards uh, transferring the powers to the Scottish level and ignore a lot of the trends that have been happening, not just around the rest of the world for decades, but actually happening over the last five years within England um, to improve the powers and the flexibilities uh, of our competing cities. And I can't deny that Manchester, although we're very friendly with Manchester uh, and we enjoy the competition with Manchester, it does scare us a little as we watch the powers that Manchester is accruing, uh, has accrued over the last three or four years. Their ability to invest in infrastructure and in skills and in innovation systems is potentially significantly greater than any Scottish city. Just to follow on from that and, and to put it into the context of um, the period since 1999, um, I mean, clearly we've seen a, 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 a change in the relationship between central and local. Um, some one direction, some other. Um, but all the while, there's been a recognition that there needs to be a much bigger transfer to the city region level. Um, and that's where the action sh you know, necessarily should be. Um, so we're beginning to see that from both governments uh, in terms of their own different approaches to that, whether it's through the Scottish Cities Alliance from the Scottish Government and the partnership that that is, or whether it's through the city deals from the, the UK government. But that, that underlining principle that if you're going to affect change at that level, and with the key ingredient of diversity and recognising the different circumstances in different parts of the economy, then there needs to be a letting go from the centre. And coming at it from, a, again, a different angle, in the submissions that you all made to the Smith Commission, a, a number of arguments were made, for example, about the importance of keeping corporation tax uh, reserved, and uh, there were also submissions in relation to employment law and other areas which seem to you to be important from a business point of view. Do you feel that the areas which have been reserved under the Smith Agreement uh, are the right ones and are sufficient to, to give that degree of uh, single market status or uh, competitive advantage to business in Scotland? I, I guess yeah, I don't think I, I've in much disagreement really with the, the Smith Commission's sort of outcome at this point in time. I think it, it, it's, and I suppose it is where it is. And there, there's a, I, I think the point that actually the Chairman raised at the very beginning, and, and I don't know if I have an answer to this, is that ha, are there enough powers devolved to help business operate in Scotland? And, and honestly, I, I don't know if I'll know that until after these powers are implemented. The point I made earlier on about my 
or biggest practical concern is is actually are the the potential business benefits through, for example, as I mentioned, biz really operating in Scotland? And the clear answer, in my view, is no. Uh, and I think there's a few of these uh, schemes and things that could be much better and more fully run out in Scotland, uh, regardless of, of devolution. So um, I, I don't know. I, I don't think we were rushing to, to list a long number of other things that might be uh, devolved at this stage as well. But uh, I think there's, as I say, with possible, again, it, well, no exception, but concern over if things don't actually work and that is again related to uh, getting people back into work as I mentioned earlier on welfare if that doesn't actually work then the devolution clearly is not adequate because the departments aren't doing as, the, as, as, as Lord Smith requested them to actually deliver this together. One, one point of general principle if I may chair uh, and, and one specific on the general principle then um, predictability um, and uh, stability uh, are obviously the watchwords in, in terms of any changes. Um, I mean, Lewis, you'll you'll know from from your position up in the northeast um, the impact of the fiscal shock in 2011 um, on the North Sea um, and that unpredictable huge change um, in the regime uh, at that point uh, was something which which our members certainly were you know pretty mad about and rightly so. And so some some level of predictability which leads to more stability as a general as a general principle. And then on, on specifics, with, with corporation tax, then our position is, is as is in, in terms of our submission. Um, but obviously, if, if there's a, a deal done with Northern Ireland um, and that changes the system in that part of the UK, then I think we would want to go back to our members over a period of time um, and look at the evidence of any impact which that may have. Obviously, the situation over there is different because of the border with the south. Um, but we would want to have a look at the evidence of any impact over time. <coughs> I think if I can just one, one comment on corporation tax. I think, obviously, I think if there's a discussion saying corporation tax will be reduced for, uh, for Scottish companies, um, I would be the last person to be sitting here saying that's a bad idea. But I think the challenge for corporation tax had been that so many companies currently uh, whose trade pretty much within the UK don't have to worry about the allocation of profits between different regions of the UK. And the, the practical administrative challenges of doing that, introducing transfer pricing and understanding domicile, those were concerns about the administrative burdens of corporation tax, which don't apply to the assignation of VAT, obviously, or indeed to the implementation of income tax. With income tax, you have to deal with an individual code for every employee anyway. So the extent to which you're doing that through the existing systems looks easier. The challenges of introducing a, a separate corporation tax is, um, well, it'll be interesting to see how Northern Ireland would deal with that were, were it to happen. But those, those concerns were expressed. Uh, uh, it's worth uh, noting. I've got a couple of supplementaries in this area, um, so I'm going to go to Duncan and then Linda. Just, just trying to draw the link between uh, the, the, the low productivity that exists, uh, not just in Scotland, but across the UK and, uh, and with our comparators. Um, and the devolution of employment law. Um, does the current situation not 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 uh, allow employ some employers and management to sweat labour rather than be innovative in terms of productivity? Does it actually, you know, would it not be a tool if we had some aspects of employment law? That where we'd heard strong disappointment last week that it wasn't evolved, that it would challenge the management in Scotland to actually address the productivity levels rather than sweating the labour and low wages, um, uh, temporary contracts, zero-hour contracts, etc., etc., which is which is a, an easy route, but um, um, you know we still remain with, with poor levels of productivity. I, I might take off an answer to that to say. Um, if I could answer the question immediately as to why we had low productivity, then I would be one of the first economists to be able to do it. So to be able to say for sure that aspects of labour policy are the most important issue about UK productivity, I'm not convinced the evidence is there to prove that. Actually, when you look at international comparisons at a UK level, it tends to be around the most the indefinables. It's not about labour, it's not about capital, it's about innovation, it's about the way in which 
uh, businesses uh, enter particular markets and are clever about the kinds of products and services they bring to the markets, which is incredibly difficult to understand what it is that affects that. The Americans' productivity levels depend on their ability to innovate. That's why we're interested in the extent to which things like centres of excellence through the likes of um, catapult centres, etc., that, and the extent to which business, uh, government and academic worlds work together practically. Uh, we think that's probably got more of an impact alongside some of the infrastructure issues that we've felt the UK as a whole has underinvested in for decades, that those are more likely to have an issue. We're actually not bad on skills. We're relatively competitive. And in Scotland, we're not bad on skills. So I'm not, I'm not absolutely sure I'm convinced that it's got a direct productivity issue. There may be all sorts of issues about fairness and distribution, but I'm not sure I can see the productivity link. Yeah, I might follow up on that. And, and, and I'm going to say I just don't recognise this sweating labour um, uh, issue that you've got, actually, and, and, and I'd like to see some evidence of that, but we'll come, that's probably a slightly set, a different expression, if you like. Uh, I think there are reasons, as Stuart says, about productivity, and I think it was something we should be addressing and really fundamentally reviewing. I think the thing I can't get my head around um, is the fact that we've got all our universities in the top quartile uh, and our research and development within business in, in the bottom quartile of OECD figures, and that just doesn't make any sense. These two things don't match as well. And I maybe should, well, no, I wouldn't want to start a debate in employment law, but maybe you could th reflect that zero hours contracts are actually to do with employment law. They're not actually breaking it as it currently is, and that's the problem. The laws are probably not helpful to actually employing people, which is part of the issue. Now, had that been devolved to Scotland, would it have been any different? I'm not totally sure it would. A lot of the, the implications for that are European, not even UK-wide as well. But uh, uh, maybe this is not the right place to go into a lengthy debate around employment law. Um, but uh, let me tell you that most of my members uh, are spending every waking hour to keep their employees employed and working to the best they can and being as productive as they can. They're not trying to sweat them. They're not trying to sack them. They're not trying to get rid of them. They're trying to find them in many cases. Uh, the thing I would slightly disagree with Stuart in saying I don't think we're fine as far as skills are concerned. I think we're still massively short in certain areas as well. Um, something notably engineering sort of thing, so we've got some real challenges on that front as well. And the evidence, again, going back to the welfare comment, a uh, welfare reform report, uh, the work that we did, without a doubt, the biggest single determining factor in whether a person was employed or not was their skill base, their skill level. Uh, and that's something we have to address as well, sort of thing. So there's some massive issues around about that in terms of productivity. And obviously we, we represent a, a, a really wide array of, of organisations through the private, the public and the, and the social economy. Um, and on balance, we, we, we came out um, in, in favour of maintaining the, the status quo in terms of employment law in that regard. Um, but you have hit on an, an issue which our members are getting really, really interested in. We ran a session just last night with Rosanna Cunningham uh, with her new Fair Work responsibility. It's the fastest selling oversubscribed session that we've had for a long time there is clearly a mood out there um, in terms of that agenda um, and whether you do that through changing the the balance between uh, Westminster and here or whether you change that in terms of uh, the partnership and the way of working and, and and trying to sort out some of the issues which David was talking about for example between uh, DWP and, and SDS um, and overlapping responsibilities uh, there is certainly an issue to be tackled, um, and there's a mood and a, and a desire and a hunger to tackle that issue. Linda, and then Rob, I think you were interested in, particularly in, in research and development issues, which will pick up some of the themes that were beginning to emerge there. But Linda has had a supplementary. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I, I'm interested um, you know, in recognition of employment skills, etc. Uh, one of the things that I was very keen for. Um, about the Smith Commission report was an, an overall cohesion. If you even break that down into the areas that directly affect your members, thinking particularly um, of things like Job Centre Plus, apprenticeship schemes, um, different incentives for employers uh, to take people on uh, and indeed promote skills. And business for an awful long time has been saying it's all very complicated. I think it's the SCDI submission that says that they would like an integration um, of everything to do with employment in relation to Job Centre Plus, for example. Um, you, you'll have noticed that that hasn't happened, um, that it's very much an admin uh, role 
that is proposed under the Smith Commission rather than having control. And I just wondered if you think that's been a missed opportunity um, in relation to your work. And I would also pull in in skills uh, the inability that we have on immigration, for example. Uh, I know in engineering uh, there is a shortage, and I know it's very difficult in some skills to be able to employ people from other parts of the world um, because of UK immigration policy having a very different slant than what's necessary for Scotland. I would reference our friends from Canada here. Canada has a system that uh, has often been looked at um, with the provinces being able to uh, attract the kind of skills they require. So, certainly on immigration, we were really strong in, in our submission that there needs to be much more flexibility uh, and a recognition of the impact of our restrictive immigration policy on an economy which clearly needs uh, to attract people and skills. Um, so we would absolutely ag ag agree with that point. Um, in terms of the, the, the overall cohesion point uh, about provision of services, our view is very much that um, there is plenty scope within current settlement for better relationships and better working relationships and a better cohesiveness between organisations which currently have responsibility. Um, and actually, we just met yesterday with, with the, the new head of the DWP, uh, the new head of Job Centre Plus in, in Scotland, um, uh, to make that point again. And, and there, there certainly seems to be a willingness on both sides at officer level. Um, whether you guys at political level um, have got that same willingness or not, um, we've yet to see. Um, and so it will be interesting to see whether, whether that um, new measure of cooperation and, and changing the nature of the relationship can move on a, a pace or two. Maybe just, if I may just very much support the point on immigration. Uh, to be honest, if I was to identify one policy, UK policy that is not fit for purpose in Scotland, immigration would be probably the top. Um, because it's just not working. And, and I know there's been work done. We've got somebody on that group uh, that one of your colleagues is working on just now to look at that, for example, re-establishing the Fresh Talent uh, Initiative or doing something. We absolutely must do something about it. It's, it's just crazy that we are turning young people away from our universities and colleges and we're also turning away from our workforce when we desperately need them and they want to be here. I mean, why are we doing this? We have a, a policy that's based for the southeast of England and just doesn't fit this country because our population, like it or not, is basically static. OK, it's gone up 200,000, but that's not a lot in, in the number of years it's taken to do, and we have some real challenge here. Something has to be done about that, without a doubt. Um, uh, so I think that's it. And I, I mean, I think, bluntly, if, even if these organisations could set themselves in the one building on the high street so as the individual who needs these services could go to the one building and get all the services, then that would be a step in the right direction, even if they weren't both run by the same government. The customer doesn't care. The customer wants the help. Uh, and I think we really need to work together, as Ross suggested. Um, I, I just want to reinforce, I think, what the others are saying, just speaking again as a single sector, but uh, in, in the engineering sector to which you, you alluded, Linda. Um, we have a chronic shortage of skills at the moment, which could be in some way addressed by, by immigrants, and the, the backdrop is just not there for it. The, the, the mechanics are not there to do it at the moment. Uh, and that would help uh, immensely. I also want to uh, support the cohesion argument. It is, it is a, a miasma to an employer who's actually got other things to do. The, the people that, uh, that, that I represent actually want to build things, not try and navigate through tricky bureaucratic landscapes in employment and the like. So anything that can be done, obviously, to, 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 to aid that journey is welcome. Touching on apprenticeships, I think that there is definitely a mood swing within Scotland, and I think it's probably post-wood, where we are now beginning to see far more cohesion between schools, further higher education and employers. And that is actually now beginning to hit the park, as we would say, um, in, in our sector. And that is the, in employment, that is the same cohesion we would look for that is now begun, beginning to come through the, the, the education and skills base, but also in employment. 
maybe just add a couple of points. First of all, to just to pick up on David's disagreement with me, I, I think I, mis I misphrased myself there, and it's a, I'm not saying there aren't skill shortages. I'm saying I'm not sure it's clear that skills have been the main reason why we've been unproductive, but because there clearly are skill shortages in engineering, and that's something that we've been quite vocal about at, uh, in Glasgow, because engineering is such an important part of the of the of the economy there. But I think on the, on the points around um, immigration, I think if we could be quite specific about the importance of, for example, postgraduate being able to uh, stay within uh, Scotland for a period of time after their graduation, that would be an area, if, if there are movements that could be achieved there, that would make a difference to some of the discussion we're having about um, the integration of business and research and development in universities and also the impact on the start-up rate in the, in the country. <laughs> uh, I constantly get asked by students uh, in postgraduate courses from overseas, what can I do to help them to stay? stay here because they want to start a business. It's a, it's a pretty regular request. So that is an area where more could be done. I think in the coordination issue, I'm certainly conscious that one or two of my members are are interested at the extent to which the work programme will, uh, transfer will genuinely have flexibility. I think it is important that uh, local authorities, Skills Development Scotland um, and the delivery of the work programme all work in harmony. Uh, at the moment you do get the sense that that doesn't happen. It's, uh, it's almost as if the local authorities and Skills Development Scotland are to some extent clearing up behind uh, the operation of the work programme. It would be disappointing if the transfer of the work programme didn't lead to a much more coherent interaction. But I agree with the point that Alan's made that we're seeing much more of that integration happening amongst the, on the apprenticeships field. That that's very welcome. Rob had indicated earlier an interest in the R&D innovation issue, and that's come up in a number of your responses, so I think it's appropriate to let Rob um, have a Thank you, question. convener. Um, being productive is the words that uh, Stuart Patrick just uh, used there, and uh, Sika said in their submission that we would welcome the exploration of further powers which could allow for additional incentives to support and stimulate business research and development. The IOD talked about R&D tax credits. SCDI talked about additional tax incentives. Do you think that uh, Smith has clarified that and that it's likely to be able to be delivered? And probably not. <laughs> <laughs> One of the challenges with research and development is that um, we have quite a few powers in place at the moment to support the existence of research and development uh, activity. We've got, um, particularly in the use of reg regional selective assistance um, and the various grants that uh, are used through Scottish Enterprise. Um, the question that actually I have to ask now is whether we really genuinely would achieve a great deal more with substantial tax powers or whether actually the company base is the right company base to, to start with. So you could reduce tax powers, it makes no difference whatsoever because the, the company base itself is wrong. Now there are particular areas where, um, for example, um, the patent box with the 10% rate, that clearly has an impact with uh, uh, life sciences companies. And it may be over time as we build up the, uh, the capacity in certain sectors and engineering in particular, that tax powers might become more effective. But at the moment, I think it's curious that we have such an array of, in, of grants available, which is the flip side of tax powers, and yet it doesn't appear to be making a tremendous amount of difference. So it's a question. Very, I think we'd be very sympathetic to greater powers to, to reduce taxes in R&D, but we just asked the question why the grant arrangements at the moment aren't quite reaching the point where you'd think there, were cha there was change. The organisations made it quite clear that this was key uh, to dealing with uh, productivity through better research and development. Have you got anything to add apart from your uh, belief that it won't occur? Would you underline uh, some of the points that you make, for example, David Watt? Yeah, well, I, th I think two or three things. I, I made the point about the, the disparity. I think there's a, something we can do already right now, regardless, before I go into the tax point, but well, we've got an, an organisation called Interface. We bluntly don't have an, an enough interface between our universities and our businesses. And I'm not blaming universities primarily for that. It's probably more business. I think also we have a tax credit system that, to be honest with a lot of businesses, actually don't 
aren't aware of and don't understand, and maybe we've got a role again to play in, in publicising that. I've got a member who's made a very significant business in the last 10 years through starting that um, and, and doing successfully, and now working in Morocco, of all places, doing a similar thing. Um, so there is a, there's a niche even for him to, while well, taking his percentage, to get companies to actually realise there is a tax credit system that's currently available, so there is a, an education thing. But I do wonder if these incentives were more widely publicised, and again, bluntly, HMRC is not normally famous for publicising the fact that it sometimes gives money away uh, in this case, and it you know, actually can be very helpful to business. So I think there's a, a real big education thing. But I do wonder if these were more beneficial, if they were able to be more targeted to local areas, to industries in certain situations, if that would be helpful. For example, one could argue that oil and gas needs support at the moment. It might not need it. It didn't need it five years ago. It might not need it in five years. Could we flex that? And that's a good question as to whether if that sort of power was with the Scottish Parliament, whether that might be more effective uh, as well, whether there was some variance of these powers as well. Now, it's quite complicated because obviously the research in itself, as far as universities are concerned, is quite a, an international business and certainly a UK business, so that's a complicated issue as well. But there's a bit of how it applies to business and gets to businesses. And Stuart's right, we have a number of schemes already, but some of them are not getting out there and we need to do that first. But secondly, there's an implication that we're maybe we don't have enough uh, out there. So I think we'd be very happy to discuss now. We might do that more fully. Um, and yeah, I think there could be an argument that having it in this parliament might make it more effective and closer to businesses in Scotland. I was short an answer, but there is a big goal to be had. And, and we make the point that uh, even HMRC recognise that they can. That there's a benefit of £3.60 to be had for every pound of, of tax credit if targeted appropriately. And, and part of that appropriate targeting would be whether um, any any change to the system would allow targeting in, in sectors which are um, uh, which are most likely to benefit from that support, for example. So if Scottish Government was able to target um, in life sciences, for example, or in, in areas uh, of the economy which were needing that extra bit of incentive um, in Scotland, which may be not necessarily so in other parts of the UK, and being able to have that variability um, and recognise the diverse nature of the economy is, is certainly something which we were supporting. Paul, in energy, other than oil and gas, the need for that kind of research and development is clearly something that goes with uh, having more tax credits. Actually, one of the things we find in quite encouraging within the city region in the West is the emergence of much closer working between the Scottish Funding Council and BIS through the, what was the Technology Strategy Board and Innovate UK, where you are seeing um, centres of excellence being supported, which genuinely bring businesses, academics and government together in single locations. So, for example, the Stratified Medicine Centre that will be developed alongside South Glasgow University Hospital or the Technology Innovation Centre that Strathclyde University uh, is close to opening uh, next to its facilities in, in the centre of Glasgow, which will focus mostly on engineering and to some extent in the energy market. That's actually quite encouraging because it's different. We've, we've we've tended to look on research and development as a, either it's sing, within company taxation incentives or it's about trying to get spin-outs out of university um, through commercialisation of university research. Actually seeing uh, university departments working alongside businesses to solve practical problems in co-located areas is relatively new. That's got some promise. So we're, we're, in a sense, we, don't we still don't fully understand the reasons why our business research and development is as low as it is. But I think we would want to have a panoply of measures from simply relying on, purely on the argument that we want to see research and development tax credits. That should be part of an overall package. It's got to be a, a much more wide-ranging portfolio of measures. I think Tavish has got a supplementary, yeah. and then, then I'm going to go to Alex, and we've been talking about how we might spend tax. I think he's got a question about how we might raise tax and divergence issues. So, Tavish. Thank you, Convener. Just uh, Rob Gibson's very fair point. Um, I was just trying to contrast that with your earlier observations about not making the tax system more complex, because my recollection, and maybe Linda would reflect this as well, was in submissions made to Smith, there's an awful lot from, if I may say, business, saying, for God's sake, don't make the whole thing even more complex. Now, tax credits was one of the areas that was highlighted time and time again about that. So could you just square the circle for me about you want more room for manoeuvre on tax credits? Now, is that going to be done through uh, and with the Scottish Government and the UK Government working together to achieve that, or are you arguing absolutely for the devolution of it? 
of those kind of tax credits that you, some of you have described this morning? Inevitably, a bit of both. Uh, and I so, if, so if, you take, if you take personal taxation, tax credit system, uh, which is overly complex, um, I mean, massively so, um, and so there are clearly lessons to be learned from that side of the taxation system in terms of business taxation. Um, and that, that balance between level of complexity and the ability to target is something which the personal tax system has, has struggled with. Um, and, but there is a balance to be struck, and it might be a different balance in different parts of the UK. No, I just... I, I I think, actually, your point about the government's working together and making it clearer, I think the point about... I'm not quite sure it has to be devolved, but it certainly has to be uh, more localised because it's not seen as easily accessible by companies from Apple Cross to Elgin sort of thing, and I think that's an issue. It's much easier to do it from here than it is from London, so that probably is a strong argument for devolution of that tax and, uh, and, and implementing and the support of it. But it is a UK system. Uh, it may be, as I say, a bit nice if it would be able to flex to industries and sectors, as we talked about, but um, it certainly has to be more localised in terms of its impact. Alex, we start to move on to other areas soon. So, Alex and tax. I wanted to talk about the, the tax system in a slightly more general sense uh, for a start. And we've seen, we've held, heard submissions on corporation tax, for example, from yourselves and from a range of groups who were fairly opposed to the devolution of corporation tax uh, because of the divergence issues that uh, may come along. But there's clearly, within the Smith Commission proposals, plenty of room for divergence in the tax regime. Uh, and interestingly, most of the witnesses we've spoken to in previous weeks uh, wanted tax powers devolved, uh, not so that they could cut taxes, you understand. They were perhaps thinking of ways they could spend the money. So what initially, what threats do you see in a divergent taxation system to businesses in Scotland? As one who sat through the early days uh, of the, the Scottish uh, income tax that's coming along, so the income tax rate and the defining of a Scottish taxpayer with 10 Treasury officials uh, on the other end of a video camera and about five of us mostly actuaries sitting in an office in, in the, the, the bowels of Melville Street recently, um, I can tell you it's, it's pretty painful as it is. So if that's an example of how long it's going to take to, to do other things, we will get some challenges in terms of just the administration of it and, and the defining of it in terms of income tax. But, yeah, I, I mean, your point is you've hinted at it at the very least is that we have a real concern that because this parliament gets tax powers, it'll think, great, we can raise them um, without, and the point we all made earlier on is thinking, what are the implications of such decisions? Uh, and this is, um, you know, if you look around the world, small countries tend to be high tax countries. Okay? If we are a high tax country, I can honestly tell you, and it's not a threat, it's a real, real reality. We have a significant number of our members who will just run across the border if we become a high tax, individual tax rate economy. Uh, it's not a place that people are rushing to be working in, sort of thing. And now there's a, a level in that, and there's a balance in that, as the certain points as we've been well publicised at UK levels before as well. But uh, And I think the point Stuart made really well earlier on is actually about... Um, while in the IOD, for example, we've been strongly against uh, devolving corporation tax, um, I suspect I'll have to hold my members back in, in Scotland from demanding it if it's devolved to Northern Ireland as well. So there's some challenges if that happens. So there's an issue there as well. But and absolutely, if we can understand the devolution of income tax. The fact that, it, as Ross said earlier on, it's personal. We all have a system. We all have a number already. You will have an S at the end of it because you're in Scotland, sort of thing, is relatively straightforward. That in itself will take some time. Um, for bigger employers, to be honest, it will be a, a, a relatively small entry in a computer system. For smaller employers, inevitably, it will be a bit more difficult. Um, but it will be in place, sort of thing, and we can work on that. So, therefore, we can... We probably will have, by the time the Smith changes come along, a, a situation in place that mechanically will make it work. But absolutely, please don't make it a licence to, to raise taxes automatically. If I go back to the comment I made at the beginning, that the most important issue that was raised by the members during the, ca the referendum campaign was that income taxes was considered to be the most significant issue. Um, and, uh, and if I take what Professor 
Kay, John Kay, was saying about how many people it would need to or in order to, to shift across the border in order to offset the impact you would have of putting taxes up uh, at the high end of the, the bandings. Um, I would certainly feel it's not impossible to see that number. He said 1,000. I don't know if that's true, but that, that certainly felt uh, a realistic number, that 1,000 a thousand people shifting across the border... That could happen if you listen to the, some of my members. It's relatively straightforward to run a business in Scotland with 90 days uh, access to the country under the, the, the taxation regimes that, uh, that would uh, allow you to do that. Um, I can think of several people who already do it. So it's feasible to consider that as an outcome. But actually, the more important thing isn't that. It's the extent to which companies would have the ability to attract talent from uh, around the rest of the country into uh, Scotland that is more worrying. Much more difficult to assess, um, but much more potentially much more damaging to particularly to engineering companies, to financial services companies, and especially to creative industries companies when you're trying to attract talent from, uh, from the rest of the UK. A number of you have spoken uh, already about the complexities of the tax system, uh, but we've also spoken about little bits of fine-tuning that you believe would contribute positively uh, to business development in Scotland. Is there not a danger that if we di allow the, the system to diverge in the way that we've described, that companies working across the UK as a whole will simply find the field becoming more complex, not less complex, uh, and that it may be more difficult to administer that sim single regime? If we come back to the guiding principles of um, transparency, predictability and, and the desire for stability, and certainly the strong message from, from our members on, on that was as long as you've got those characteristics of the system, then changing aspects of it as you go can be dealt with um, as long as there are no shocks being, being brought in. And you're, and you're not imposing um, a... a uh, a structural change to the system which is going to impact unduly um, in, in one part uh, and, and therefore have a, a knock-on effect in, in another part. And so having that predictability, if you like, and th that drive for stability is, is, is clearly the overall riding concern. Um, and having changes to individual, individual taxes or allowances or credits is something. It's just the, it's just the meat and drink of systems, um, and and certainly um, companies and organisations are are used to dealing with that both in a in a national sense and in in many um, of our members' view, uh, because they operate in regimes across the across the world, different fiscal regimes across the world, um, whether it's a, you know it's a federal scheme or or whatever, then th that kind of balancing goes on all the time, but it's got to be done on the basis of sensible relationship, sensible rules for the game, uh, none of the um, shocks to the system uh, which are introduced at, um, at the whim of you know, the, the, uh, the incumbent administration at any level, um, and that there's an, a, an agreement that the overriding aim, and let's face it, the the central policy purpose of both governments, publicly stated, is uh, the growth and stability of the economy. So there should be the ability to come together um, and create those conditions uh, for uh, predictability and, and, and that, that level of reassurance. Let me get to the point I was trying to make. <laughs> the <laughs> if you look at the general powers that have been... Uh, devolved to Northern Ireland over a number of years now, uh, particularly uh, not tax, in fact, but maybe the welfare spend, what you find is that a great many powers have been devolved, and in fact what the government in Northern Ireland have spent their time doing is changing nothing. They've tried to shadow the UK system. If we look back again at taxation, tax powers are not a new thing for this Parliament. We've had the power to vary income tax since 1999. We, in the past week, have heard announced changes to the uh, land and property taxation 
tax that's being brought in. And we've heard John Swinney uh, talk at great length only yesterday about how he wants it to be revenue neutral. He wants to ensure that there is a, as little as possible deviation between the effect in Scotland and that in the rest of the UK. Are we not in danger of going through a process where we devolve a huge number of powers under the Smith proposals to the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government only to spend many years in the future not using these powers to ensure that we don't create any differences? It, it's all, to be fair, it's all we can do is make the case for any change and then it's over to you guys. So you have no fear? <laughs> no, no, I did ask for succinct answers. Yes, <laughs> no, I suppose just to add to the point, I mean, that, that's what devolution is about, you, and, and we work in involved countries, so you understand. I, I, I do think there's a genuine benefit, potentially, to decisions being made more locally uh, on things like taxation as well. Because, the, you know, Scotland is not London. You know, and the UK is guided a lot by the activities of London, and and there's a very strong argument for you and your colleagues determining a tax level which is different from that in London, uh, to attract people into this country to work. So why not? But um, uh, and I would think lo lowering tax would be brilliant for the economy of Scotland. Personally, um, your point about that hasn't been much evidence of that in the recent past. Sort of thing. Will there be in the future? I don't. There'll be a compunction, as you well know, to, to to set the tax levels, and then there'll be a lot more thought and debate about it as well. But no, it's the point again. We keep making is there is an economic impact to decisions this Parliament makes, and sometimes business doesn't think it always thinks that through very much now because you're dealing with income. You'll have to think that through, and we will hopefully benefit from the results of it. Potentially, we could suffer. Yeah. Maxwell's got a supplementary, and then I'm going to move on to other areas. So. <laughs> feel like a slightly worn record, but uh, I go back to uh, my, my opening statement saying that in, in an industry which is very dependent on the public sector and on a low margin, uh, obviously any change of direction is we are very sensitive to. We, are also, we also urge, and we did in our submission to Smith, we, we, we urged caution in the introduction of any measures. We didn't say don't. Uh, and I think that, um, and in fact, perhaps we, sh we should have said more there. By all means, have the powers and then at the appropriate time consider using those powers, but not don't ask for them. Mr Maxwell, and then I'm going to go to Stuart McMillan. I think he's got a question around the EPD. So. Uh, thank you very much. And perhaps, of course, Northern Ireland um, hasn't made much change in its powers, but its powers over welfare, because, of course, it only has one half of the balance sheet. Effectively, you don't have the revenue, revenue raising powers. You can't make much change in terms of what you would do, for example, with welfare. So, but that's, that's the point that uh, I just wanted to put on the record. I, I think the people who, the people of uh, other small countries, might be slightly confused by some of the comments we've just heard uh, around the panel. Um, do you think people of Norway and Switzerland are, are, are desperate to hand away their tax powers because they've made such a mess of creating wealthy economies in, in their countries? Because it seems to me they've done, done reasonably well when they've actually uh, managed their own affairs. And yet we seem to have an underlying belief that the transfer of powers to Scotland over a range of taxes would create a threat and that divergence would automatically mean a worse situation in Scotland. I, no, I, I certainly didn't. I, that doesn't reflect what I said um, at no, all. No, at the end you didn't, Mr. Watson. No, I, and 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 the, uh, nor do I feel that. I mean, I think Scotland can be fantastically successful. The political system, regardless, will business will thrive and survive and go in with that sort of thing. Uh, but what I'm saying is, a high tax economy. If you've got a lower tax economy, uh, you know, 100 miles away, is is slightly different from Norway and Denmark and Sweden. And if we could all interest. It, so, some of these countries, some, some of these countries share borders, but they also share pretty high taxation levels. And I mean, I've just had a very long conversation and diatribe from one of my members, in fact, whose wife is Finnish, who spends a lot of time in Finland. Uh, and, and just to cheer you up, he voted no very strongly because he says, I don't want to live in a small high tax economy. And all of these are small high tax economies. Now, whether I say that, and that's not the view of the idea, necessarily my view, but the, the, we've got to, there are some potential ramifications uh, of being a small number of people, sort of thing. So anyway, but let's part that. That's, that's the past What I argument. want to ask about, though, is um, because the, the question that Mr Johnson asked was about the threats. I want to ask about the opportunities that such a thing would bring. 
the, the evolution of tax. I highlighted costs. the key because opportunity we, is is actually is exactly what I highlighted. The key opportunity is bringing it closer to businesses locally, and having the chance for you as a parliament to make decisions locally that help the people of Scotland in taxation. And but raising taxation is not necessarily going to make business you very popular with business, or indeed help the economy, or indeed the people of Scotland. But you would accept it, because we heard a lot of across the panel about people fleeing across the border. We had some of that nonsense during the, the referendum campaign. The, the parties that supported a, a yes vote were very clear, certainly we were very clear, that what we wanted to do was create an economy that actually was good for business, that would grow the economy, that would create more wealth and opportunities, and that that would be shared by the people of Scotland. That was the, that was the argument that we were, we were making. Now, effectively, I wonder, if the taxation powers and a basket of taxation powers, not just income tax, but a basket of taxation powers are devolved, do you think a Scottish government would not use that opportunity to invest in the very areas to actually create the wealth and the opportunities for the companies that you represent? It's difficult to tell, I have to say. From the, some of the early discussions about um, tax, income tax, most of the focus has been on the 50 pence tax rate. Yeah. That doesn't give us a sense that you are going to use a basket of powers to assist uh, we, the we growth of the economy. Of the but but, but, but it, well, it come, come as no surprise if we sit here rather edgily at the notion of well, what would that basket of powers be used to do. Um, it, 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 I would say it, the, the circumstance you highlight, particularly around Norway and Sweden, we don't start from the position that Norway and Sweden start from. You start from a position where there are values and assessments about the future made by your existing population. And in your business base, a fair number are concerned that taxes might go up and that they might act accordingly. And some of them are very familiar with the acts that you need to take in order to manage that. And in doing that within the UK, is dead easy. You can run a FTSE 100 company from... Buckinghamshire uh, that's based in Glasgow. You can do that quite easily. And so many, many of the folks that you might increase their taxes might choose to do so. But actually, as I said, the point isn't that uh, a number of folks would make that decision. It's the impact it has on our ability to attract talent in from the rest of the UK. We absolutely depend on that. We don't start from the same position as Norway and Sweden. Yeah, but I'm, what, I'm, what I'm concerned about is the idea that, that you come from the principle that autom almost automatically that we would... About 50 pence tax rates. That's why oh, sorry, we're making no, these... Not, I think you, you find that's the Labour Party policy uh, that they've been advocating at the moment. But well, I, think I think the issue... Well, it means in general. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to ascertain that you, whether or not you believe there are opportunities, that there are opportunities that a Scottish government would recognise those opportunities and if they had those tax powers, would use those tax powers sensibly not to damage the Scottish economy and Scottish business, but actually to try and help Scottish business to grow and actually create employment. And that seems to me a quite an obvious... It's conceivable, oh. it's conceivable, but it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't come across within the existing discussions. And, and differentiating between what could be the case if the result had gone differently in, in September and what's the case at the moment. We're talking post-referendum, uh, and, and, and this, the Smith Commission is obviously a, a result of that. And so it's within the context of Scotland still being part of the UK and so our submissions were all on that basis and the discussion with our membership was all on that basis and I think we've all made it clear that we want to see more flexibility, we want to see more diversification of the system, we want to see um, powers for a purpose if you, if you want to use that phrase, if I can drag in the, 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 old, the old word subsidiarity you know, and, and you, you levy a tax at the, at the, at the area of impact and we've all given examples of where we think that is appropriate. Um, we might not agree across the board on each of those examples, and collectively those examples probably add up to a lot more than each of us in individually would go, but we've all given examples of where we think that flexibility is appropriate and it would have an impact economically, a positive impact uh, economically, and it would create opportunity. OK. Um, I think we move on to... I think it's Stuart... McMillan, with a question on the EPD, and I think, Mark, you were indicating an interest as well. So. Uh, uh, thanks, Convener. Um, uh, good morning, panel. I've read your submissions, uh, and I'm keen to uh, get a bit more information in terms of uh, your rationale behind your positions on EPD. Well, it's pretty simple, actually. I mean, 8 per cent of uh, Scotland's companies export at the moment. 8%, um, which is not a glorious figure. So every single uh, 
tool that we can use to uh, help them uh, move abroad uh, and look for exporting sorry, uh, opportunities, not move abroad, but actually work abroad, is, is very beneficial to this economy and to their companies. In simple terms, if you fly out of Scotland then you fly through London, as many as have to do in other places, you're paying taxation twice. We would like to see direct flights. Of course, that's their number one priority. And the government and the airports have worked very hard at doing that, and we applaud that. But ultimately, it's expensive. Uh, at the moment, we pay. If I fly out of Edinburgh, as I will shortly, I will pay more to the UK government than I pay to Edinburgh Airport. That doesn't seem a good use of my money, to be honest with you. So I think there's a real challenge here in terms of the costs that we, as, as business people, it's very expensive. If you travel, and get, get I could get figures wrong just at the moment, but basically if you were to travel business class and if you're going to China to do business, as so many businesses are encouraged to do, and you're going to be thing about paying about £250 in taxation to get there. That's a lot of money. And if you're then trying to cultivate links in China, you're going to be going about five or six times before you get any money back, or even have an agreement to do business. It's a lot of money going to the government. We really do think this parliament has to recognise the challenges. And we are geographically remote. And just final story, I remember a number of years ago with, going with a now uh, departed airline who started business class flights direct into Munich. Uh, and sitting in Munich Chamber of Commerce saying, look at this fantastic map of Scotland, I'm sorry, of Europe. We are right in the heart of it, but we are not. We are right at the extremes of Europe. So flying is a massively important part of doing business in Scotland, and it always will be, um, So, regardless of environmental challenges. And we must make it bluntly as cheap as possible. And, and just, to, just to follow on from, uh, from those points there about Munich and Bavaria, um, the Bavarian figure for export in is roughly 10 times ours. Um, and clearly they've got the connectivity issues uh, broadly right. Um, air passenger duty is, is probably the, the tax with the least evidential basis for its introduction, and it's the tax which has probably been increased most in its short life. So since its introduction in 2007, and on short-haul flights it's been increased by up to 160%, and on long-haul flights between 260 and 360%. There's an enormous increase. And so you know, when people talk about uh, the low marginal cost of APD, then, as David said, in terms of personal business travel, it is a huge cost and a massive barrier to people getting out and, and selling uh, a, a, around the world. So we're very clear on, on APD um, and, and, and the need for its reduction and eventual removal. Um, and whether that's transferred or not doesn't really matter. It's the tax itself which is the key aspect. Just add a little bit to that is to say we absolutely agree entirely with what uh, David and Ross have said about the locational issues about APD, which makes Scotland different. Um, we do have to depend more on air travel than uh, and hubbing than if you were flying out of even Manchester. But actually, the other another ad aspect of this is the extent to which it makes it difficult to attract airlines to invest in. The, the, the routes from uh, uh, Scotland because it, it has an impact on the rate of return which they will assess in making a decision to uh, to set up a direct flight. Uh, David was absolutely right that the most important thing for us is to get as many direct flights as possible, but we know full well that that's, that's uh, uh, difficult because we tend to be quite low down the list of priorities for international airlines who are currently expanding all their activities into developing markets. We want to get a Chinese airline in into, into the UK, APD is just another uh, aspect of the rate of return that they're calculating. We heard uh, yesterday uh, in the Parliament uh, there were two, uh, well, the issue of APD came up twice, once in, uh, in questions to the Transport Minister, uh, my colleague Willie Coffey asked a question regarding Presswick and how it would actually help the Ayrshire economy, but in the morning time, uh, with the, in the Finance Committee, uh, the issue of APD came up, uh, and the comments from the CBI uh, stated that uh, that uh, the APD shouldn't be devolved. Now, with the comments that, that uh, the panelists have just mentioned, uh, surely, um, surely the, the, the CBI are out of touch with actually uh, with, with the economic situation here. <laughs> <laughs> go, go for it, Ross. <laughs> I'm not going to mention those three letters. Um, <laughs> but I will mention the other three, APD. Um, I mean, APD, there is a recognition um, across the whole of the economy and, and everybody who interacts with the, the, the transport system um, that the impact of APD in Scotland is, uh, is disproportionate. 
Um, and so we need to start with a sensible discussion with Treasury about the, the impact of that um, and whether um, a, a, a relative change in Scotland can be affected, uh, regardless of whether the power is transferred or not. So the Chancellor, given again, given his, 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 I think it was when he was given his evidence yesterday to, to Treasury Select Committee, he said that um, with, if APD was abolished in, in Scotland, then they'd done some measure of work in terms of the impact of that on Newcastle and Manchester. Um, they were predicting uh, a 3% impact on Manchester, which is obviously manageable in his, in his language, uh, and a 10% impact on Newcastle. And obviously there would have to be some mechanism by which Newcastle was given some measure of support as well. So, you know, UK government are alive to the issue as far as as, as far as we feel in our discussion with them. Um, and if if APD can be reduced and abolished even quicker under the current arrangements without going through the transfer of powers, then all the better. Um, if it takes the devolution then fight, you know, that's, that's something we're willing to, to look at and consider. I just, uh, again, the tail end, Charlie, but uh, for reasons of pure sort of ge geography and trading, um, we believe it should be devolved. I think, so, uh, okay. the, uh, in terms of uh, that, then, do you think it should be devolved immediately? Yes. I say as, as soon as possible, to be quite frank with you. I, I would, like Ross hinted at, I'd like to see the bluntly abolition of the tax as soon as possible. Well, that's feasible or not is a different story, but well, it's not something we're supportive of. It, it does damage business, no question about it. It is expensive, as I pointed out. Okay, um, I think Dunk had a sh short supplementary, yeah, and then I'm going to Mark. Supplementary, I, I suppose it's the nature of this, um, you know, taking a single issue and not connecting it up to everything else. And I think we had that last week with welfare. But, you know, on this single issue, it's a big important issue for business, has been for some considerable time. The less tax take there has got an implication on what we can spend in construction or what we can spend on the welfare. You, we, you know, the, I suppose that we're in this unreal situation where we, we look at all of this, like last week, where we want to maintain welfare spending or increase welfare spending. We want a minimum wage. This week, we want to cut taxes. We want investment, increased opportunity to borrow more and investment in R&D. Now, that, that, that doesn't work. You can't do all of that and cut taxes here, there and whatever and maintain the welfare budget, increase research and development or indeed pay for increased borrowing. I mean, it's a... Absolutely, you can. That's how you run a business. Okay, you increase your income. You increase your income by having more people in employment, by getting the 360,000 people in Scotland who are distant from the workforce into the workforce, paying tax. You can spend more tax. That's how it does. That's what we need to do in this country. Okay. Another thing I will add slightly. One point I would you probably all disagree on this. I think we should look at the fact that you've just mentioned, for example, earlier on living wage. I think the government needs to look at how much money it's taking from people on minimum wage and living wage before it starts telling business to start paying higher wages as well. And that means there's some issues around about the money we currently spend in this public sector, to be honest. But that's, and again, another big debate. APD is an isolated example, and it can be treated as an isolated example because there is no basis for APD other than a tax grab. And, and the impact of removing, you know, reducing and then re removing APD, um, all, of, uh, all, all the point of our submission is that it's a huge barrier to growth. And so if we can remove APD um, and therefore grow the economy, um, and we think that is a particularly strong barrier, uh, then there is a balance in effect. It might not balance it entirely, but there's certainly a balance in effect. I think I actually did. To round off on that, our own strategies at the national level do identify areas which we think, on the whole, have an impact on our growth rates and on our productivity. Exports and research and development happen to be two of those. So it's not as if it's that, that these discussions are happening in, uh, uh, without the context of a, of a properly thought through strategy. I will admit that earlier on the evidence I'm saying I don't know that we've got all the answers to the, to the problems that we've been discussing. But at the very least, I think the APD and exports, the relationship is extremely close. Um, and I would argue that, therefore, it, it can be 
treated it, much as Ross says, as in, in isolation. Um, I think that takes us to Mark, and then I think Lewis has got a question. Mark. Yeah, I note in the, uh, the Institute Director's submission, it talks about the fiscal regime on oil and gas, which uh, is obviously topical, and it generally is, uh, certainly is all the time when uh, in, in the northeast of Scotland. And you mentioned, Ross mentioned the, the 2011 situation, obviously the current situation, and I think it mirrors what, what David was saying, is that where there are job losses, one of the ways to protect those is through the introduction of key fiscal measures. The introduction of, for example, exploration credits, as Norway did in 2005, has been mooted. I know in your submission you talk, uh, you, you suggest uh, a Scottish input to tax on oil receipts and, and the oil and gas fiscal regime. I just wonder if you could elaborate on that and how you would envisage the Scottish input working. I think to some extent, just like the answer to your own question, I think, I, I think it's, I, and it also relates to a point I made earlier on, I, I do genuinely believe that taxation uh, closer to uh, the payer of taxation, closer to the business operator is beneficial in, in terms of understanding what they're doing and there's also a sectoral input and that's a classic example of that I think with oil and gas. Um, to be honest I'm not quite sure in my own mind how the mechanics would work, I think that would need to be teased out um, in discussion but I absolutely do think for example right now at the moment we have a classic example of where Bluntly, if, the Scot if this Parliament had uh, powers over, um, and in even more influence, bluntly, over the regime of tax in the North Sea, I think the regime would change much more quickly. Bluntly, now, there is a chance, I hope, that the Chancellor do something in the budget. Bluntly, my view should be doing it today. Uh, and I think if this Parliament had the powers, regardless of party, I think they'd be doing that right now. So I, I do think the Scottish, the Scottish Parliament should have an, an input to that. Whether it goes as far as actually having it devolved I think it should, personally, because I think, again, it's a very specific area. Uh, it's hard to think of another area, because even renewables, for example, where we've got predominance, that is still a UK very strongly based organisation. Oil and gas, uh, or industry, oil and gas is very much Scotland's baby, if you like, sort of thing, and has to look after it and nurture it, uh, and should have a very real input to that. Uh, and as I say, at the moment, it's a classic example of that. So I would be in favour, bluntly, of Scotland having that sort of taxation powers, the ones that you've suggested, for example, that have been flexed in other countries, would be well res residing in this parliament. I think they'd be quite well handled for that particular industry. Whether it's a model that could be followed in other places, I'm not totally <coughs> sure. Or other industries, I'm not totally sure. But that's a classic one that it is bluntly, it's 90% a Scottish industry, if we're honest. If that power isn't transferred, where it's retained, then there is a need for the Scottish Government to have input into into some of those uh, some of those discussions. So, for example, on, on decommissioning and the decommissioning of the leaf deeds, there's no mechanism at the moment for the Scottish Government to have an input into those uh, uh, to that discussion, uh, and there certainly needs to be. I think we're going to continue this conversation for just a little while because I've seen a few folk put up um, for for supplementaries. Mark, anything else? Uh, Lewis, and then I'll move to others. Lewis was it indicated first, and I'll come to you. Yeah. My, my, my question was slightly stepping back a little from the oil and gas thing, although very important though that is, so can perhaps... I, can I come back perhaps, perhaps, uh, yeah. I think both, both Alec and Tavish were in, specifically in this area. We both put our hands up at the same time, I think. It was on the issue of the, the devolution of the, the oil and gas tax regime. Now, the reason why that hasn't been proposed is that if you look back historically, the volatility and the potential tax take in that is enormous. Uh, and twice in the last six years, we've seen the oil price drop from the 130, 140, uh, in some cases, right down to uh, $35, I think, six years ago. And we're currently hovering at just under the $50. So that enormous <coughs> volatility must, uh, if that was to be devolved, uh, must have a, surely a parallel uh, borrowing power that has the same scope to cover that volatility. Uh, if we were going to devolve the tax powers over the North Sea, or tax on the North Sea, how much borrowing power do you think would need to give us continuity? Well, I'm going to say, uh, as an embarrassing position, I find myself being a spokesman for the SNP here. <laughs> I'm going to say that 
if I was in business and I had a lot of money coming from oil and gas, I wouldn't have spent it all at the same time as it came in. I might have been protecting the country against the volatility sort of thing as well, as other countries have done. So I think, um, and that is not, a, it happens to be a party policy. It's not made as a party point, it's made as a business point about how we actually spend money in government in this country uh, and just assume that oil and gas will constantly be bringing us in money when clearly it won't be. Now, you're saying that because of the size of the UK we can accommodate that. Well, we'll, we'll find out how that goes from the Chancellor deals with it over the next year and 18 months, that fall in tax state that he'll have as well. Um, but I think the point that Ross made is if... And, and the point is, is valid about the income... Uh, about the, the, out, the outcome of these volatility changes. But my, my point is that Again, the government should be reacting more quickly to these volatility changes in doing something. And it does seem that at Westminster, bluntly, it's not been reactive enough. Well, it might be taking the pain, it's not actually doing the things it has to do. And I think going back to and very much know the situation in 2011, the industry wasn't horrified that it was taxed. It was just horrified it wasn't told about it. Because we go back to the previous time it was taxed heavily by Gordon Brown, the then Chancellor. Bluntly, he told him he was going to do it. And they had a best part of a year to prepare for it. The last time they were horrified it didn't happen. Now they're horrified because there's no really working with them to actually get over this, they think, relatively short term, although BP now say three years, problem. So I think that's where there's no, there's no working with anybody at the moment. That's the problem that's actually going on. So, yeah, it might be, and, and that would be your argument for not um, devolving the... the the impact would be massive in a, in a Scottish budget, absolutely. I'm not saying necessarily all the tax income should be devolved, but certainly the, the input and the, the consideration of the taxation level should involve this Parliament, because this Parliament is very closely engaged with oil and gas. We would certainly agree with the point about um, spending, spending the income more wisely and in, in what's happened in the past. Um, and, and that's um, emphasised by our uh, suggestion in, in terms of um, tax relief credits in terms of um, being able to support cash into infrastructure projects, for example. And if that had happened in the past, then, for example, Aberdeen would have had a mass transit system uh, linking up uh, the key economic areas of the city centre, the airport, the university and, and the port. Um, and hopefully that can, can be put in place um, in, in, at some point in the future. Um, but we're not arguing for the devolution of, of, of the fiscal regime. And, you know, if you take the uh, the point which um, the press had a, a bit of fun with, um, the, the points which the Governor of the Bank of England was, was making um, earlier, uh, earlier this week, uh, then uh, that aspect of the balance in terms of the UK economy um, and its ability to withstand that shock is a point obviously well made. Um, and, and there are aspects of that discussion which you clearly uh, point out, Alex, which, which our members would agree with. Yeah, just two questions on the evidence that you've given. Firstly, um, to Ross Martin, uh, the Smith Commission has a lot on intergovernmental relationships, so your point about decommissioning, I hope you might accept, would be, uh, would be or potentially moved forward by the strength of the work that I make, I can say without fear or favour, both John Swinney and Michael Moore did on, on uh, uh, putting that into Smith, so there's some very solid stuff there in terms of, of your point on decommissioning and how, I, how um, the Scottish interest would be taken into account there. And secondly, can I just ask David Watt, I mean, when I met BP's North Manager on, uh, North Sea Manager on uh, Boss on, Mon on Tuesday in Aberdeen, he said it's not just the tax regime, I absolutely agree with Mark on this, it's not just the tax regime, it's also the supplier costs and uh, the internal company cost structure, which is the three legs to the stool of what needs to happen in the North Sea right now to make sure we're a competitive industry in the future. And I hope you might just accept that the tax regime is absolutely fundamental. I agree completely on what you said, but there's two other legs to that stool which need to come ahead too. I maybe just make a point. It's always uh, something I have to do is represent the Institute of Directors. Uh, we are not an organisation that supports uh, outrageously high wage levels at any point for company directors or anybody else. And the fact that our wage levels apparently are about a third above Norway's at the moment is not a healthy situation. And I think many people saw that coming. I don't think it's necessarily always had good impacts for somebody whose son had to move out of Aberdeen because he couldn't afford to buy a house sort of thing. And I, I know very well what the impacts had for a lot of people. So I think I'm not defending that. And I think, bluntly, that was coming anyway. And your point is valid in that respect. And, and sadly, it's resulted in job losses where I would rather have seen the, the and, and salary cuts for many people. Um, maybe if that had happened, more 
uh, thoughtfully as these wage levels develop, we might not be in this situation quite so much. Point is that the cost is a big issue as well. There's no question about that as well. And, and I must just very strongly support Ross's point about, and, and, and one of the reasons that that's in there, when I did my draft, uh, uh, my comments about North Sea's in there, when I did my draft, my Aberdeen committee were the one group who were really jumping up and down about, you haven't said anything about oil and gas, it's massively important in this country. And also I think the fact the fuel ignored to some degree, and the point about infrastructure is a valid point as well, the fact, and, and my committee has just started again, jumping up and down the fact you can't get to the airport. In a, in, a, in a train, unless you then get a bus to get to the airport, you know, it just, it's just, honestly, oil and gas, it's terrible. We don't have a direct flight to going back to APD to America, into the oil capital of Europe sort of thing, there's strange things going on. So a lot of that is, again, going back to giving Alec a hard time with spending money, but generally, we haven't spent on some of these things, as he knows all too well. Thank you very much. The, the, the Smith report contains agreed recommendations for devolution. It also includes seven areas. One of them is uh, a fresh talent initiative for, for graduates uh, on which the two governments should work together. But it also says that the two governments should work together across a whole range of areas and that needs to be improvements in joint working and, and in also in accountability departments. I was very struck in the SCDI submission that it reflected 50 years of concern about the regional balance within the United Kingdom, by which I mean balance among the city regions, but also balance between Scotland and uh, uh, the north of England on the one hand and the south of England and uh, London in particular on the other hand. And that's an issue that clearly is still with us. I was, I was, I'd be interested in comments, and we've just heard very eloquently the, the, the issues facing the oil and gas sector and how important that is. I'd be very interested in, in, in the views of the panel about what can be done now in the context of the Smith Agreement by joint working across the UK to address that regional imbalance. Joint working, better working with the North of England is something that's been mentioned in one or two of the submissions. The strategic corridor from Aberdeen to Newcastle, again critical to many economic activities uh, within the northern half of, of, of this island. Um, what more can be done between governments and between central and local government to strengthen those economic links and strengthen, strengthen uh, that rebalancing, if you like, of the UK economy. When our membership looks in on, on um, <coughs> Scottish Parliament and, and government and UK Parliament and government and looks at the relationship between them, we see, um, we see instances such as the Scottish Select Committee, um, which could be meeting here, um, and being more accessible. We see the Prime Minister today in Edinburgh, not in this building. Oh, sorry? He will be, yeah, yes. but, but not making his announcement. Uh, we, see, we, see, we see a lack of cooperation and a, and a lack of maturity about the relationship between the two governments and the two parliaments. And... And looking in from outside, that just looks weird. And, and so there was a big issue about the symbolism of that and what kind of message that sends in terms of the willingness of both governments and both parliaments to work together. So there, there's a symbolic issue first and foremost. And then there's the practical, the day-to-day -day aspect. Uh, and whether we are in, um, in the territory of... Um, undoing 50 years, or in, in Sir Richard Lisa's words, the, the leader of Manchester, undoing 100 years of, of centralisation. Uh, if we're in that game of decentralising, and whether the decentralisation stops here or goes further out to the city regions, uh, if we're into that game, then fantastic. And our membership would support that where, that, where the impact of that is measured, where the impact of that is recognised, and where there's an evidence base uh, to, to move in that direction, but not decentralisation for decentralisation's sake. Sure. Um, a couple of thoughts on this. First of all, just in the context of um, the centralisation issue, yes, we're over-centralised, but equally we're having to deal with over-centralisation to the global city of the world, and London is an unusual city now. It's not a question of talking about Germany or Italy or France. This is a very strange set of circumstances we have to deal with. Um, London and New York battle with each other to be the most 
successful cities in the world. So it adds to the challenge of regional development. Where, um, so as a consequence, we very much welcome the move between Scottish and UK governments to support a Glasgow City deal because that was part of um, a, a general move around the UK to look at how you devolve powers to local regions that reflect local economies. I think the important part of, of that deal is that it's regional, it's city regions, not just in central cities. So you're looking at having to change the structures of government or the, the arrangements within the city region in order to implement. That's a, that's a helpful move. Manchester has been well ahead of us in that respect, I have to say. But equally, there are some other examples where um, perhaps the interaction between UK and Scottish governments could improve over time. Um, I think it's useful to see the Scottish Funding Council and the Technology Strategy Board or Innovate UK begin to look at uh, complementary decisions that reflect the UK's research base and the extent to which universities work together to exploit um, technolog technological improvements that cut across the borders. And I think that's beginning to show signs of, uh, of improvement. But one where I'm sure there's more to do is between UKTI and SDI, where the extent to which the joint working um, has been uh, notably lacking. We work very closely with UKTI because we do trade certification. Um, we don't find ourselves working so closely with SDI because we don't do so much in the way of trade missions and so forth. But it's notable that the two organisations have very different approaches to life. They are, they're using infrastructure that could be much more easily shared and would help to tackle uh, one of the biggest challenges we have in accessing export markets. Yeah, I absolutely support that point. I think Brian Wilson's review that identified that as an issue as well. Uh, I think Scottish Export was very useful, actually. I think something we should all adopt and, and follow through. And that was one of his key points. He gave examples of good cooperation, but equally some pretty bad examples of lack of cooperation. And I've personally experienced that, and I think it's really not helpful at all. I think that's an area, without a doubt. I think the whole area of infrastructure, indeed, particularly broadband, is another area where there has been some UK government input, and that, that's helpful. There could be more on that front as well. Crown Estate is mentioned significantly, obviously, as you're aware, in the, in the Smith report as well. But I just would re-emphasise again, DWP, Job Centre Plus areas there. Biz, Seed Enterprise Initiative, for example, is, is a great scheme, little known in Scotland to us. We need to work and do that as well. And there's faults on both sides, probably, as I said, for that as well. But there's certainly, there's, I mean, there's lots of areas that would be very beneficial to this country if we work better together. Okay, I think, Linda, I think you had a, your question, all right? And I think it, we're almost coming. Supplementary to the, oh, sorry, you've got a welfare one. I'll, I'll take your welfare one first. Oh. On you go. No. Um, welfare is an unusual issue to raise with you. Uh, however, we've discussed it with a lot of other people. Now, one of the things that's said quite often in this parliament is that when we're talking about uh, those who are on low wages, is that the welfare system is effectively subsidising companies to employ people on low wages. Now, we have people talking about proposals that might suggest that in Scotland we can increase taxation and we can increase the level of benefits. Is there a danger that that might just further subsidise low wages in the Scottish economy? <coughs> My, my answer to that is no. I, I, a couple of things. I mentioned a couple of times already. I, I was invited by um, the then Deputy First Minister to sit in her welfare reform group, uh, and I was happy to do so, but not signing up to the premise of in an independent Scotland bit. I wasn't signing up to that bit. But, um, uh, and I, I've got to say two things. First of all, I learned a lot um, in that group as well, because a lot of the presentations that we had probably did away with some prejudices even that I had around the welfare as well. And I would certainly recommend that document. If you haven't already read it, then please do. It genuinely is an, um, important and a lot of interesting inf and relevant information to your question on that front as well. And I, the other key area I wanted to be involved because I see the, the absolutely crucial link between welfare and work. Uh, and um, most people, um, the number one thing they want uh, is, is a job and a sense of being out of that job as well, and that's really important. So we should be using welfare system, a benefit system, to get people into the workplace, and we should be not seeing the two things as different. So I think there is a, a, a there is not an easy connect at the moment, if I'm honest, as well, through some of the systems, and I understand the UK government is trying to help, 
And I'm not negative about their efforts to help, but the problem is they're starting a system that is arguably broken and trying to mend it. In some ways, it would be nice if we could start in square one and not have a system and just start, but that's not going to happen. So we're going to have to work with the system we have and develop it into something that uh, does actually work um, to get people back into work gradually and to stop silly things like, I can only work 16 hours. I mean, I constantly, constantly get employers saying to me, I want to employ this person for longer, but they lose all their benefits. Not only lose their working tax credits, they lose their council tax relief and lose their various other... But it's just, well, I know, and, and that, in, in essence, is simple. The problem is the switch over to that is assuming that it's nobody... And that's the real problem, the people getting caught in the middle of that. And if I'm honest, in that switch over, we probably don't have enough people. It's not for me to suggest employing more people in the public sector, but in that space at the moment to do that changeover, which might in the longer term work for some people, I've got to say. But absolutely, this, the fundamental thing is the relationship that employers value. They need to understand a simple system okay, that needs to encourage people to work, even if it's gradually getting into work. But genuinely, I had an employer only a couple of weeks ago saying to me, I've got a cleaner who worked for me, and she probably isn't earning a lot of money to be here, but she wants to work more, but she can't. Now, that's a ludicrous situation we've got ourselves into. Mm -hmm. We have to stop that. Okay, I'm not blaming anybody. It's just where we are just now, and we have to sort that. Can we sort it better in Scotland? No, I think we, uh, we possibly can, but we can only sort it with cohesion. Okay. And the other point I made earlier on, the relationship between skills development in Scotland and all the evidence that I heard is the number one reason for people um, being on low wages is low skills, bluntly. So if we upskill people, they will not be in minimum wage or living wage. They'll be beyond that. So we can't dissociate skills development in Scotland, their role with Job Centre Plus, their role with Business Gateway and all these other organisations working together to help these individuals to get to a point where they're not anywhere near that minimum wage as well. And, and, and again, I'll back to if, if government wants to really help people in minimum wage, stop taxing them, OK? Mm -hmm. But once you help people in living wage, stop taxing them when they earn that sort of money. Don't blame employers. Stop taxing them. Why are we taxing people 20% on that money beyond £10,000 to £13,500? Couldn't agree more. I still want to contribute, but I know that both Duncan and Tabish had issues about the role of the parliaments. I need to get them in at some stage. But Linda, I think you had an yeah. issue which is related it, it, to... Yeah, it's sort of related. Um, I mean, the Institute of Directors' submission... Um, you actually uh, say in it, David, about um, you wanted the Smith Commission, and I remember this coming in at the time, to facilitate economic growth while promoting economic and social fairness, uh, which ties in with what you've said. And I've no reason to believe that that, that is not the, the, the mission of, of everyone who's involved in this, and indeed most people in Scotland. I was, my initial thoughts were, do you think that the package that has come up um, from the Smith Agreement could help promote both of these strands. But since even thinking about that question, um, I have had, had a note of some of the things that are in the, the heads of agreement and the draft clauses that have come out today. And it would seem, there's, there's a couple of things that I find concerning that I'd like your views on. One is that the UK government is, um, seems to be maintaining a veto over changes to welfare, for example, and there are issues about additional benefits. Um, the other thing that, that may be found quite concerning from the conversation we started earlier is that it looks like capital grant is to be replaced by borrowing powers rather than augmented. And I wondered if there would be a quick reaction to that. Well, at this stage, it's coming from a, an outside source. But yeah. A, 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 do what the best you can with that, with this new information, obviously. Yeah. Well, that's not easy. I don't think we're in a position um, to, to respond to those, but what I can do is, is, is respond to the context for that, that yeah. question. Um, and the context is that we as an organisation come at the whole debate um, from the economic perspective and looking at the impact on, on the economy. So if, if you're talking about um, some of the issues which Alex was raising or, or, or Linda, then it's that issue about what are the barriers to productivity? What are the barriers to innovation? What are the barriers... Mm -hmm to internationalisation. And clearly, pegging somebody to 16 hours is a barrier to productivity. If somebody wants to work more, 
and they are a productive person, then we're limiting their productivity as an individual and limiting the productivity of that, that organisation. So there does need to be a recognition uh, of that as a barrier, in the same way that a, a poor childcare system is a barrier to work and a barrier to productivity. You know, we exclude huge section of our population uh, from productive work because we don't have in place an accessible, affordable, flexible childcare mm -hmm. system, which is why SCDI are working with Children in Scotland and the Child Care Alliance to have a look at that system right. uh, to see whether we can drive that from an economic perspective. The most exciting aspect of the White Paper by far from SCDI's perspective was taking what was previously seen and historically seen as a social policy drag, the cost of childcare, and ramming it up front and centre as an economic driver and having a recognition of bringing that social policy agenda and the economic agenda together. And that it symbolises the journey upon which this parliament is, is on in terms of Smith and, and the rest of the, the, you know, the other side of the balance sheet. So it's taken the social policy agenda, the economic agenda, and trying to understand the impact of one on, on the other and not look at them in isolation. And I think there are a number of different examples uh, which you could pull on, uh, which are barriers uh, to, to, uh, to productivity, which fall into that, into that category. Could I maybe just add one on that point about context? And it's just it's to pull it down into the, the uh, locale I know best. Um, the, the, the comment earlier about skills and the extent to which the system supports the achievement of skills to then subsequently achieve a, a good living wage. Um, two points I'll make on that. The Centre for Cities report that comes out every January constantly highlights one challenge in the west of Scotland, which is that we're very, we've actually got very high levels of high skill for the proportion of our population with graduate level degrees is, I think Glasgow's the eighth out of 64 in uh, the country and other Scottish cities are near to the top of that list too. But Glasgow's equally very near the bottom when it comes to those with no skills at all. Now, a lot of the powers are already there in place to actually tackle that issue and we still haven't managed to do so. Uh, so I, in some respects, I'm not sure that the Smith Commission debate is actually getting to the heart of that issue. I'd also, just as a side point um, around the comments of uh, uh, welfare more generally, one of the reactions I've found within my own membership to the, the whole discussion uh, through the referendum debate was to raise the issue of the living wage, um, where previously there was a knee-jerk response that said, well, we don't really fancy that. It could be adding costs that we don't want. Quite a different attitude is developing now that says, you know, this might actually be an important part of the success of our companies. Some companies for a long time have said that living wage was part of their competitiveness yeah. package. It's how they attract people into their business and how they, how they grow the productivity of their own firm. Uh, we've now agreed, uh, we're, we're, well, I've, I've certainly got a decision being made by my Council of Directors on Monday to open up a full review of our position on the living wage, and I think that will be beneficial for the, yeah. for the future. Thanks, Convener. Can I just say I hope we can all work together to try and achieve what we all quite clearly want? <coughs> now, in the last bit of time we've got available, about eight minutes, I'd like to have a discussion about the role of the Parliament. I think, Duncan, you'd... Just quickly, quickly and bear in mind... mind. Mm -hmm. um, it, 1999, uh, uh, prior to that, of course, Consultative Steering Group, many of them still around, set up the, 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 the Parliament's procedures. Um, uh, principle was that it was going to be different from Westminster, and we, and we, we are living with that in all its shapes and forms. I suppose the question is, given uh, additional welfare powers, taxation, and the, uh, is the Parliament um, able to provide that that scrutiny, uh, is it up to the job to take on these responsibilities uh, and how do we need to change to ensure we can provide that, that scrutiny, that oversight, uh, that governance? There's a cracker. That's a good question. Well, one thing I would be quite honest, that one thing I've heard a lot, and this is not an IOD position, but just in general conversation I have with quite a lot of learned people around the country, that this is a unicameral system and uh, there is some that was always going to work as long as we had a coalition government, uh, but now having a majority government, it makes it more difficult for it to work as well, and the scrutiny um, of that is an issue. 
I think the other thing, I suppose, in a practical terms from a business point of view, and I think something Stuart mentioned earlier on, is that one thing that does concern us in terms of, of all the changes going along, and it's really the basis of our discussion today, is, is what is the economic impact um, for business of the decisions the Parliament makes? And how, to some extent, does it know that? Is there an economic assessment of the, of, of the exercise of its powers? And I think sometimes there's not. So there needs to be some... I would suggest sounding board, he suggests a business advisory board, whatever you want to call it, that actually does that. And I'm not sure the Council of Economic Advisors serves that purpose at the moment. My experience, it seems to back, back and forward between the Scottish Government and, and everybody writes a big long paper, which everybody just about reads, and then they send another big long paper back to each other. I think if that is the body, then it needs so much more power and teeth. But somebody needs to be looking at the economic impact and outcome of the decisions of this this organization from a from a business point of view that's the issue whether it means um a restructuring of committees or another chamber or something that's uh, way beyond my pay grade i think we just uh, reiterate what we made right at the very beginning that dave was highlighting there that um uh, some form of standing group that has a business advisory role to the parliament, not to the government, but to the parliament, is something that we wonder might be useful uh, as you're going through all of the, conte the, 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 the content of the Smith Commission and any other developments that may occur as a result. Um, we couldn't begin to tell you how that would work in practice because um, we're no experts on the systems and management of the Parliament, but we do think that the Parliament needs to have that kind of uh, support um, rather than simply the government. Mm -hmm. Specifically, um, one of the, the major points of engagement is the Business in Parliament event, um, which isn't all that it might be, and that there's some work which could be done um, in order to shape a better um, relationship. Um, and then, in the wider sphere, the National Economic Forum is beginning to show signs of um, usefulness and purpose, um, but there's still some work to be done on that as well. Just on the same theme as, as Duncan has raised, I mean, the SCDI submission to, the, to today's uh, meeting says on this issue that committees of the Scottish Parliament need to display the same independence from party politics and forensic analysis which characterises the best of the committees in the UK Parliament, especially at times of majority government, either by coalition or by single party. So is it mechanisms or is it people? Are we to, are we to blame? <laughs> it's us. I think, I think, by and large, you've demonstrated today um, that independence um, of party, um, and the engagement has been on a um, on a basis which we would expect. Mm. Um, but there is a, uh, I mean, it's a it's a young institution, mm. and it will take time for for it to develop its own character and its own way of working and its relationship with others, um, and certainly. Uh, when we ask our members their views of the Parliament and, and parliamentarians here, then they're very much on the basis of you've not got enough incentives. The framework doesn't allow you uh, enough incentive to focus on economic issues. Uh, and so there's, a, there's an issue about the context in which you live. And hopefully um, the result, you know, one of the central results of the, the, the Smith transfer will be that it provides a better framework uh, in which to operate and more incentive to focus on, on the economy and, and economic growth. Mm. Yeah. I was just going to support that very much. And, and this sounds really sycophantic, but I do think, generally speaking, the committees that I've been in front of have been very uh, sensible and non-partisan in their approach, to be honest with you. I think I can genuinely say that. I think, on the whole, MSPs are fantastically accessible to, to businesses locally and things like that as well. I think ministers through governments, in, the, in my experience, the Scottish Parliament have, of whatever political hue, have been very accessible, Tavish being one of them amongst us, and Bruce himself as well. And I think that's been a fantastic thing, that approachability and, and that nearness to the business has been really helpful in terms of listening to what business people, and I will say real business people, not people like us, actually think uh, is really, really helpful in, in, in terms of developing it. But I think the point Ross made as well, that, that yeah, maybe some more if you had a little more power in terms of economic development and were able to flex your muscles more, I think you could have more local impact as well. well again, speaking it's a very sort of dependent um, sector um, from, from, from this parliament. Uh, we have great faith in, in the ability of this parliament to actually deliver on, on, on our agenda uh, and are very happy that it gets further powers and uses them uh, in, in a gradual and uh, measured manner.
of positive stuff. Don't think that. I suppose again, it, 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 it maybe it'd be a discussion for for politicians in the parliament, but but we have we have we have a, 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 a responsibility of committees, numerous responsibilities as legislators, inquisitors, inquiries, uh, to develop policy, um, and review legislation, etc. And uh, you know, I'd, personally, I think we are struggling to fulfil all of those roles. Now, if we're going to have more of those powers, what's you know? What should our focus be if we're changing? Should it be that, that, that's the point I'm trying to get at? We're, we're attempting to do too many roles, maybe, but not good enough. But we should maybe prioritise in some of the some of the other areas. If, if I could, that's a big question, actually. And if you can answer it very quickly, that'd be great. But I recognise that should, that's something a journey we're going to have to really begin on and get our teeth into. But. The answer lies in, in a, a central thrust from all of us throughout the, the, the session, which is with the decentralisation down to city region level and, and to the islands, um, for example, then that should free up some of your time. And that should allow you some more space and scope to take on some of the other responsibilities that you're getting. Yeah. And I would just very quickly add to that, I think the, that's where I think the, the business advisory group or whoever could actually help you rather than, do, rather than cause you more work. And I think one thing I would say that I've been nice to politicians a minute ago, the other thing that really very careful to uh, as a politician is listen uh, as well, and that's a lot of time. And, and people will tell you things that are very helpful. I've done a lot of listening today. <laughs> Uh, and the insights you've brought to us have been very helpful in our deliberations, so I'm very grateful to you. Um, uh, as I close the meeting, I just remind, remind members that our next uh, meeting of the committee will be on the 5th of February, when we'll begin consideration of, glass, of the draft clauses with evidence taken from a range of taxation practitioners. Well, obviously, we'll meet next week on the 29th um, to have a private briefing on the technical issues around the clauses and those who have not had the opportunity to do so to respond to whether the visit to, to Hamilton could be let the clerks know as soon as possible. And lastly, as well as thanking our witnesses, can I thank our visitors from Canada who have been listening into our uh, proceedings today. And I close this meeting. Uh, thank you very much.